Britain gave the world its first passenger railway in 1825, the nation that pioneered rail travel that connected continents and revolutionised transportation somehow managed to fall spectacularly behind. Today, Spain has 3,973 kilometres of high-speed track. France has built 2,800 kilometres. Japan runs trains at 320 kilometres per hour through densely populated cities and mountains. Even Switzerland, a country carved by the Alps, has engineered high-speed capable lines through some of Europe's toughest terrain, threading trains through vast base tunnels beneath entire mountain ranges. Britain's solution? A single 110km line to the Channel Tunnel, and an infrastructure project so troubled it became the world's most expensive railway per mile. So what went wrong? How did the birthplace of passenger railway end up struggling to keep pace with the very nations it once inspired? Let's find out. On September 27, 1825, George Stevenson's locomotive pulled the world's first public passenger train from Darlington to Stockton, carrying 450 people at 24 km per hour. This single event changed human history. Within decades, Britain built the world's most extensive railway network, connecting every major city and transforming the Industrial Revolution. The British essentially wrote the rulebook on how railways should work. Stevenson's standard gauge of 1,435mm became the global standard that most of the world still uses today. Fast forward two centuries and the story looks completely different. Britain now has one of the densest conventional rail networks in Europe, carrying more passengers than France, Italy or Spain. But when it comes to actual high-speed rail, the network barely exists. Internationally, high-speed rail is defined as new or specially built lines capable of speeds of around 250 to 300 km an hour or more. Upgraded existing track may count if it follows 200 to 225 km an hour. HS1 remains Britain's only full true high-speed line. Other intercity routes are mostly upgraded legacy lines with occasional sections that allow speeds up to 200 to 225 km an hour, but they still contend with curves, legacy infrastructure and frequent stops. Compare this to France, where the TGV has been running since 1981, or Japan, where the Shinkansen began service in 1964. Here's where the excuses begin. Critics of high-speed rail in Britain love to blame geography. The country is too small, they say. The cities are too close together. There are too many curves in the existing tracks. Too many towns and villages are blocking the way. Britain's population density of 260 people per square kilometre is often raised as a barrier. But consider, Japan has 334 people per square kilometre, with far tougher terrain. Spain, though large and mountainous in parts, has densely populated areas in its cities. So yes, Britain is dense, but not uniquely so. But let's examine these claims. Switzerland, despite its mountainous terrain, operates upgraded and newly built lines reaching 200 to 230 kilometres an hour through vast tunnels and valleys. Its base tunnels, like Gotthard and Chenery, prove that with consistent investments, even the Alps aren't an obstacle. Japan presents an even stronger counter-argument. The Tokaido Shinkansen runs through one of the most densely populated corridors on Earth, connecting Tokyo and Osaka with 45 million people living along the route. The line crosses rivers, mountains and urban areas, far more challenging than anything in Britain. The Japanese built this in the 1960s. France has spread its TGV network in every direction from Paris, covering both flat agricultural land and difficult mountainous terrain. Spain built nearly 4,000 kilometres of high-speed track, the second longest network in the world, despite having a lower population density than Britain and significant geographical challenges. Ironically, Britain's smaller size and the short distances between its major cities should make high-speed rail easier, not harder to build. Britain didn't just sit idly while other countries built high-speed rail. The nation tried repeatedly and failed spectacularly. The Advanced Passenger Train Project tells you everything you need to know about Britain's approach to infrastructure. Developed in the 1970s and early 80s, the APT was supposed to be Britain's answer to Japan's Shinkansen. The train featured pioneering tilting technology that would allow it to take curves at higher speeds without making passengers uncomfortable. In 1975, the experimental APTE set a British speed record at 245 km per hour. Everything looked promising. Then British Rail made a catastrophic decision. Facing political pressure and possible cancellation, they rushed the service prototypes into passenger service before solving technical problems. The trains experienced mechanical failures. The tilting mechanism had issues. Passengers complained of motion sickness. The media pounced on every problem, turning the APT into a national embarrassment. By 1986, all supports had collapsed and the trains were withdrawn, their parts scattered to museums. 
The tragedy? The APT technology actually worked. The tilting system was later sold to the Italian firm Fiat Ferroviaria, which refined it and used it in their Pendolino trains. These same trains, based on British technology, now operate successfully around the world. In 2002, Britain even bought back Pendolino trains to run on the West Coast Main Line, essentially repurchasing their own technology decades later. Meanwhile, the Intercity 125, developed as a stopgap measure using conventional technology, became one of Britain's most successful trains. Why? because it worked reliably from day one, even though it was slower and less innovative than the APT. The lesson British officials learned was exactly the wrong one. Instead of understanding that rushing projects causes failures, they concluded that innovation itself was the problem. Then came the HS2, Britain's attempt to finally build a proper high-speed network. Proposed in 2009, the project promised to connect London to Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, and other northern cities. The train would run at 360 km per hour, journey times would plummet, regional economies would boom. It all sounded fantastic. When HS2 was first proposed, it was expected to cost about £37.5 billion. By the time it was approved in 2012, that estimate had already climbed in real terms once inflation adjustments were accounted for. But reality hit hard. By 2025, the cost for just Phase 1, London to Birmingham, had ballooned to between £49 billion to £56.6 billion for just 225 kilometres of track. HS2's first phase is now estimated to be £396 million per mile, about eight times what similar high-speed railway segments in France or Spain cost. Compare this to other countries. France's Tour de Bordeaux TGV line cost £25 million per mile. Spain's Madrid to Galicia line cost the same. Even Germany's most expensive stretch, Stuttgart to Munich, came in at £70 million per mile. Japan built almost half of the Hokkaido Shinkansen line through tunnels for just £50 million per mile. The project kept shrinking. In 2021, the eastern leg to Leeds was cancelled. In October 2023, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak scrapped the northern section to Manchester, citing ballooning costs and delays. In October 2024, the Labour government confirmed it would not resurrect the cancelled phases. HS2 now runs only from London to Birmingham. The project that was supposed to revolutionise British transport has been reduced to a £50 billion railway connecting just two cities. Part of the cost comes from environmental mitigation. For example, HS2 includes a large back corridor in Buckinghamshire, costing tens of millions of pounds to protect wildlife. Individually, these costs aren't unusual, but added together, they significantly contribute to escalating budgets. The line requires 32 miles of tunnels and 130 bridges, many added to appease local opposition rather than engineering necessity. Every time someone objected, HS2 officials responded by making the project more expensive and more complex. France builds high-speed lines by starting from both ends simultaneously and meeting in the middle. This allows heavy machinery to move along newly laid tracks, avoiding the need for expensive access roads. Britain divided HS2 into separate contracts awarded to different companies, making coordination nearly impossible and driving up costs dramatically. The project has been led by five different CEOs and overseen by six prime ministers, eight chancellors and nine transport ministers since 2012. Political instability killed any hope of consistent long-term planning. Research by Britain Remade examined over 200 infrastructure projects across 14 countries. The findings are damning. Britain pays twice as much per mile for railways compared to the average seven other wealthy European countries. Tram projects cost 2.5 times more than in France. Underground railways cost twice as much as Italy, three times as much as Germany, and six times as much as Spain. This pattern holds across every type of infrastructure, roads, bridges, tunnels. Everything costs more in Britain. The problem runs deeper than HS2. Britain spends significantly less on transport infrastructure than competitor economies while achieving extremely poor value for money. The nation has created a toxic combination of chronic underfunding, political short-termism, bureaucratic planning processes, and a culture that empowers every possible objection to delay and complicate projects. Each new government arrives promising infrastructure investments only to cancel previous plans and start from scratch. The irony stinks. In 1825, Britain demonstrated to the world what passenger railway could achieve. 200 years later, British passengers travel on modernised Victorian infrastructure while watching other countries zoom past at 300 km per hour. 
HS1, the only true high-speed line Britain has, was completed on time and under budget in 2007. Government studies later estimated hundreds of millions in annual economic benefits. The line proves that Britain can build high-speed rail successfully when it commits to doing so, but HS1 was an exception, not the rule. Everything since has been plagued by the same problems that destroyed the APT and are now strangling HS2. When Sunak cancelled the northern sections of HS2, he promised to redirect £36 billion into Network North. Sounds reliable until you see what gets lost. Over 33,000 construction workers and 3,500 UK businesses were building HS2. They weren't just laying tracks, they were developing expertise Britain desperately needs. Spain and France built their networks quickly and cheaply because they maintained consistent construction. Workers moved from project to project, retaining skills, improving efficiency. Meanwhile, nations like China have built over 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail in less than two decades, crossing deserts, mountains, urban zones, doing many segments at a fraction of the cost per mile of HS2. Britain does the opposite, start a project, cancel it halfway, lose the expertise, then start over at even higher cost. When you cancel projects, workers scatter, the institutional knowledge vanishes. Next time Britain tries to build something ambitious, it starts from scratch, repeating expensive mistakes. Geography isn't Britain's problem, neither is population density nor land costs. Virtually every major European economy, from France and Spain to Germany and Italy, has built high-speed rail. The real barriers? Political dysfunction, planning paralysis, cost inflation and zero ability to maintain long-term commitments. The solutions exist if Britain chooses to implement them. But what do you think Britain should do about its high-speed rail crisis? Should the country finally finish HS2 or scrap it entirely and start over? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and if you enjoyed this breakdown, hit like and subscribe for more stories about how geography shapes nations.